uh, to our colloquium, quantum contextuality in quantum mechanics and beyond. We are resuming it in the invitation. It says that it is the ninth meeting, but in fact, it's the tenth one. I miscalculated. So that will be the tenth um, colloquium or meeting of the colloquium. We had to uh, take a break to conduct our workshop and then and then there was summer holidays and the beginning of the semester. So now we are beginning again and hopefully we'll continue until um, until we'll have to take another break for the for the next uh, contextuality workshop, which will be next uh, in May next year. So um, uh, we are uh, fortunate today to have as our speaker Rui Barbosa. Uh, and um, uh, you all um, have the invitations with the, with the uh, title and the summary. Uh, Rui is currently at the International Iberian Na Nanotechnology uh, Laboratory. And uh, I will let him to introduce his talk and um, uh, and to proceed. So, Rui. Um, hi, everyone. I'm sorry. Uh, I think there's a bit of background noise that just started. I hope it's not interfering too much. Uh, it's coming from uh, the street, so I have no control over it. Uh, so, um, let me start by the, by thanking um, FTBAR and the, and the organizing committee. Uh, it's an honor to be giving a talk at this uh, colloquium and, and to sort of mark the start of the second season of the uh, KCQMB colloquium. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is about the resource theory of contextuality. And if I'm, oh, I should share the screen again. Uh, there we are. Okay. I think that's working. So, and this is this is uh, or the majority of, of, of what I'm going to be talking today is, is joint work with uh, Marty Carvonen, who is at uh, the University of Ottawa, and uh, Shane Mansfield, who is now at uh, uh, the quantum startup Guandela in Paris. Uh, and some of this is also uh, sort of stems from prior work with uh, with Samson. Um, and oh, I can't move the slides. There we are. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, so much. Much of what I'm going to be talking about today is available online in this preprint uh, from uh, April of this year, and uh, it will appear at some point in in a volume of uh, of Springer's dedicated to uh, to Samson's contributions to logic in computer science and beyond, and and it also, as as I said, sort of stems from work that was originally done uh, in collaboration with Samson uh, by the three of us. Uh, so let me just give a very brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So as we all know, um, and I, I should probably be preaching to the choir in this audience, but contextuality is, a, is sort of a, a quintessential marker of non-classicality. So it's a characteristically non-classical feature. And uh, it is an empirical phenomenon, so it can, so it can be witnessed on the, from the empirical predictions of quantum mechanics rather than just from its theory. And it distinguishes in particular, it distinguishes quantum mechanics from, from classical physical theories. But it can, as I said, it's, it's this empirical phenomenon, so therefore it can be studied at a sort of theory-independent level without making reference to, to quantum mechanics. Uh, it has also been established in, in more recent work as a useful resource uh, connecting to quantum advantage in, a, in certain computational tasks or, or information processing tasks more generally. And... Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, this is sort of uh, so. The, so this is sort of brought, brought more interest in, in studying its uh, its role as a resource. And one of the tools for doing that is to consider resource theories. And the idea of resource theory is that uh, we focus the shift from objects to morphisms in some sense. So rather than focusing on uh, the question of whether a particular uh, some particular correlations or or empirical model are contextual or non-contextual, then what we now care about, or we focus uh, our, our focus, to, sorry, we, we shift our focus to, um, to considering transformations between uh, correlations and which, which of them can be done classically. Uh, and therefore, this allows us to compare uh, different instances of uh, contextuality 
uh, in terms of also of the strength of contextuality and what can be simulated from what, what can be transformed to what uh, freely, and uh, how, and also this relates to issues of quantifying how much of these resources there. And um, so therefore the basic uh, object of interest is no longer just an empirical model or, or correlations, depending on your preferred uh, framework, but it's, uh, or terminology, but it's sort of simulations from an empirical, from empirical models of a certain type into empirical models of a different type. And, and in particular, which are the free operations which are given by procedures that can be implemented classically, sort of without using any contextuality, that's, that's sort of the sense in which they are free. Uh, and in this talk, we're going to focus only on non-adaptive procedures. So just to uh, make a brief mention, so uh, so this kind of goes back. So I'm, I'm going to so what I'm going to talk about is is in the framework of the shift theoretic approach to contextuality that was started by Samson Abramsky and uh, and Adam Brandenburger, and uh, this particular. Sorry, should uh, we still be seeing the first slide? Hello. I'm still on slide one. Is, is it right? No. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, yeah, the slides are, aren't moving forward. I see. Okay. Uh, let me see. It should be on this slide. You can now see something or? Yes. Now yes. Yeah. see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well. I see. So maybe I have to stop sharing and then I, I present and then share again when it's presenting. Is that the way to do this? Uh, well, I think all you had to do is just to, to switch it to, to the slide, uh, to slideshow mode. I, I did. I, I was on slideshow mode. Uh, oh. uh, so I, I was seeing the slides on slideshow mode here, but uh, they were they were apparently not appearing in there. Uh, so maybe what I'll do, maybe if I can share my, if I share my whole screen, then you can see something, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see if I share that. So can you oh, now see the? Yeah, okay, no. now it is. It, it is on slide mode. Or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry about that. So. Uh, um, right. Okay. I mean, this is this is basically what I was what I was just saying. Um, uh, so I, I hope there's no. Uh, yeah, I hope it's sufficiently clear. But if you, you just want to another minute, point, just to have a look at that. There is a small yeah. window of reopen closed PDFs. If you can close it. Uh -huh. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, Rui, if if you prefer, you can begin all over again. If you, if, I mean, I'm uh, as you, as you prefer. I, I can just I can just uh, uh, well. I mean, it, it will be recorded and and posted. So if you want it, to be, uh, I think I think it's I think that's right. I think it's okay. Uh, we'll uh, I think we'll, we'll just carry on from here. Uh, so as uh, just just. Summarizing, as, as I was saying, sort of the focus on resource theory foc uh, sh is shifted from 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 considering objects to to morphisms and so to convertibility between uh, empirical correlations or empirical models. And as I was saying in this talk, we're going to focus on non-adaptive procedures. And I was just about to say that uh, yes, so we're working within the the framework of uh, Abramsky and Brandenburger, uh, the shift theoretic framework to contextuality, and this work sort of goes back to. Uh, our paper on the contextual fraction, which first introducing some of these operations uh, for the resource theory of contextuality. And uh, about the same time, there was another paper by uh, uh, Barbara and uh, uh, Marcelo Adan and uh, Leandro Alita, I think, uh, who developed a sort of a, a similar resource theory for contextuality in, in a different graph per graph approach. Uh, but the uh, uh, but anyway, so here I'm focusing on 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 the on the shift theoretic approach, and also uh, after that there was also this paper by the three of us and uh, Samson where we considered adaptive adaptive procedures and measurement protocols. But here, as I said, we're in the, in this talk I'm just going to focus on non-adaptive procedures. And in particular, uh, one one question that uh, we will 
uh, address here is to try to understand which maps uh, between empirical models, so which uh, functions that uh, map empirical models of a certain scenario S into empirical models of a different scenario T do arise from classical procedures, therefore can be implemented by free operations. And uh, the way to uh, answer this is that we will construct a new scenario built out of S and T, and any such function big F from empirical models of S to empirical models of T will turn into an empirical model itself on uh, this new scenario and the fact that it can be realizable by a classical procedure corresponds exactly to the non-contextuality of this new empirical model with, with a small caveat uh, that we'll get to uh, during the talk uh, and moreover this provides uh, for, for those who know what that means this provides a close structure on the category of, of measurement scenarios so let me let me try to start and i'll start very slowly and i'll introduce the concepts of uh, uh, of the, the sheaf theoretic uh, formalism in hopefully a very sort of uh, not very not very in depth manner, but but uh, sufficiently graphic and and hopefully uh, easy to follow, and also of of the the notions of the, the of classical procedures and the, the resource uh, trans and the free transformations in the resource theory of contextuality. So first about contextuality and just to set up our uh, framework. So what we consider so, uh, is that we have a system that we'll treat as a black box. And this interaction with such a system can be, uh, sorry, I just need to remove these, uh, I have all of your pictures in the middle of the screen. Okay. So interaction with a system is done by performing some measurements and observing the respective outcome. So for example, here is a black box. There are three possible measurements and, um, oops, and we might, for example, choose to measure the, the, the green measurement and we'll observe a corresponding outcome. And one important feature of, of this, which, which is what makes it interesting, is that there is a compatibility structure of measurements. So we're not allowed, so we're allowed to perform certain measurements together, but not, not necessarily all of them or not all combinations of measurements can be performed together. So in this example, for example, so what this graph here is, is uh, illustrating is that we can, for example, uh, measure the green and the blue measurements at the same time and observe a joint outcome but we're not allowed uh, or we can measure also the green and the, and the brown measurement at the same time but what we're not allowed to is for example to measure all three measurements at the same time so the box won't respond to that so this is sort of the basic uh, framework uh, that describes the, the the type of measurement scenarios the measurement scenario order the, the type of systems that we're dealing with and it's essentially described so a little bit more formally by a finite set of measurements, in this case, the three measurements X, Y, Z, uh, an outcome set for each of these measurements. So each of these measurements uh, will take values on a certain outcome set. So here, for example, it could, they could be dichotomic measurements. And then an abstract simplicial complex that uh, is just a set of faces, so the set of measurement contexts, so the set of such contexts that uh, sort of the the set of sets of measurements that can be performed together. And uh, so being an abstract simplicial complex is just a way of saying that it contains all singletons. So every measurement on its own can be performed and it's downwards closed. So if you can perform a certain set of measurements then any subset of that set can also be uh, performed. Uh, so this is what a measurement scenario is. And this describes the type of black boxes that we're considering. Uh, but now we're also interested on its behavior or, or on what we call the empirical models or, or the correlations. Um, and such behavior is described by the measurement statistics that one gets out of that box. So for example, and, and those can be sort of organized in a table like this, where here, for example, three eighths means that if I measure, if I decide to measure X and Y, which is a valid uh, context, uh, then I'll observe the outcome zero, zero with probability three eighths or I'll observe the outcome 0, 1, or probability 1, 8, etc. We can sort of fill out this table, either from the predictions of quantum mechanics or some physical theory, uh, or, or from actual um, empirical, um, like collecting empirical data from one, one such uh, um, system. Uh, I see that there are some, oh, I see, okay. Um, Okay, so, so that's what, a, what an empirical model is. So it just specifies the 
the behavior of a system or the measurement statistics that you get out of measuring all, all of the possible contexts. You get a, so for each possible context that you can measure, you, you get a probability distribution on the joint outcomes. So this should be familiar to, to most people in this audience. Uh, and moreover, uh, we are requiring uh, here that, that our uh, empirical models uh, satisfy no signaling or no disturbance. And what that means is marginal distributions agree. So for example, if you uh, decide to measure X and Y together and then forget the outcome of Y and sort of ignore, which means sort of summing over all the possible outcomes of Y, then this should give you exactly the same thing as, you, as if you decided to measure x together with z, which is also valid context, and ignore uh, sum over the outcomes of z. So in, in both cases, you should get the same probability distribution over the outcomes of just x. <coughs> and this is, um, so this is essentially what an empirical model is going to be. So it's just a probability distribution on the set of joint outcomes for each possible context. And they are required to satisfy this marginal, uh, this condition of marginals agreeing, which is no no disturbance, sometimes called no disturbance or, or generalized no signaling condition. It, it does correspond to the usual uh, notion of no signaling in the case of Bell scenarios, which are uh, uh, distributed uh, over uh, different parties. Uh, uh, okay, so. If we're, so now we have a description of, of these black boxes, of the type of black boxes and, and their possible behaviors or empirical models. And there's a question of, um, uh, another question we may ask is uh, sort of what goes inside a black box, right? And the simplest case you could have is just a deterministic model where there are some predefined outcomes for each possible measurement. And any time you decide to uh, perform some measurements, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Any time you perform, you perform uh, but then you, you have a probability distribution over such deterministic assignments. And this is still considered to be classical, and this is exactly what, what it means to have to be non-contextual. So a model will be non-contextual exactly when there is, uh, when it can be described as just a probability distribution over such um, um, deterministic assignments, global assignments of outcomes to measurements. And that's exactly what, what it says here. So there's a probability distribution on global assignments, which restricts to the empirical distributions for every um, uh, allowed context. Uh, and of course, a non -cont uh, contextual model is something that's not non-contextual, <laughs> and, it, and it is when, when you don't have such a global probability distribution. Uh, so, so this sort of concludes the, uh, the, the first uh, so the setting up of the, the, the framework uh, uh, for um, and, and the notions of contextuality in this framework. And we can now move into uh, the resource theory of contextuality. And the idea of resource theories, as I uh, was saying uh, at the beginning, is that we're now uh, considering not just uh, single boxes or single systems, but we're considering transformations between boxes, possibly of different types. And in particular, we're interested in free i.e. classical operations, uh, which will be procedures that can be done classically that use a box of type S to simulate the box of type T. So let, let's try to uh, define more precisely what we mean by these. And the first notion that we need is a notion of what we call an experiment. Uh, and so what is an experiment? So, so it's an experiment on a box S uh, with values in O, and this is this is essentially just a protocol that describes how one would interact with this box S in order to produce a value in O, or, and therefore it has to specify two things. So first is which measurements, if any, to perform on the box S, and then uh, secondly, uh, how to interpret the the joint outcomes that we get uh, into an outcome uh, in of, of the intended type. So for example. Uh, here we can, so an X experiment here represented by this little lab book and it's, it's telling us two things. So first, which measurements to perform, in this case, the green and blue measurements. And then uh, also, and so if we go to implement it, we're going to do that and we'll get two outcomes and we need to have a function that interprets any, any possible joint outcomes of the two measurements into an outcome of the right type, in this case, uh, what we called O. Um, 
Okay, so that's, that's just what, what, what is an S experiment. And now a deterministic procedure between S and T is just going to be a collection of such S experiments, one for each measurement of T. So essentially for each measurement of the box T that we want to perform, uh, the way we're going to obtain um, an outcome for that measurement is by performing an interaction with the box S. And, uh, and there's only one slight caveat that, that I'll get to in the, in the next few slides, which has to do with the compatibility structure of S. And so we can't just take any arbitrary S experiments and assign them to, uh, to the measurements in T. And then, so this is a notion of deterministic procedure and then a classical procedure is just going to be a probabilistic mixture or a, a, a convex combination of such deterministic procedures, here represented by the, the little dice on the left. Okay, so how how does uh, how do classical procedures relate to such to simulations or to simulation to sort of building a box T out of a box S? And it's kind of the the way I guess you'd expect. So so here you have your black box T, and let's say you want to implement you want to measure uh, uh, the pink measurement here. And what's going to happen is that uh, it's as if you had this little experimenter inside there, which is just going to follow the protocol corresponding to the pink measurement and uh, perform some interaction with S in order to obtain the right outcome uh, of, of, the, of this pink type. Uh, but now note, so here similarly we have something, uh, if you measure red, you have some other uh, experiment that you perform inside that, that gives you the outcomes for red. Uh, and if you perform both of them together, and this is this is key. So if you perform both, if you decide to perform both the pink and the red uh, measurements together, then you have to imagine that you have these two little experiments that are working in parallel to each other, so are concurrently without uh, interacting, and each of them will follow the corresponding protocol, either the pink protocol or the red protocol. And this immediately tells you that there should be some condition on these protocols. Because you could be in trouble if, for example, you had, if imagine that the, the, the orange measurement had such a protocol here, which requires you to measure both uh, the green and blue measurements in S. And if you now try to perform it together with a red, with a red measurement, whose protocol uh, requires you to measure the brown measurement in S, then we have, uh, we were in trouble because the sort of the, the little uh, orange experiment sir is trying to measure both the green and blue and the red experiment is trying to measure the brown and we get in trouble because we're trying to measure three measurements whether the box s only allows you to perform uh, uh, two measurements and, and never the three of them together uh, given its compatibility structure uh, therefore um, so this, this tells you uh, that there is this additional um, um, additional restriction on the definition of a deterministic procedure which forces you to choose um, uh, to guarantee that whenever you follow each of the experiments corresponding to each measurement you have to uh, you, you you never perform you only ever perform something that's within a context uh, or a set of compatible measurements of the box s so a little bit more formally so a deterministic procedure between uh, a scenario s and a scenario t consists of two parts so the first is a simplicial relation. So what it means is that for each measurement in T, we specify a subset of measurements of S in such a way that if I have a set of compatible measurements in T, so a context of T, then uh, the union of all the corresponding measurements in S that we'll have to measure has to be, a, um, has to be also a context in S. So if we perform compatible measurements in T, then whatever measurements we're, the, 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 the experiment asks us to perform in S have to be uh, compatible, or the, the union of all those measurements. And the second part is just the interpretation of, so it's, it's a map from the joint outcomes of each of these uh, sets of measurements that we perform for a single measurement into outcomes of the measurements of T. So it's just a way of interpreting joint outcomes from S into the, the right outcomes of T. And then a probabilistic procedure uh, is, again, it's just a, a convex um, combination of such deterministic procedures. Uh, okay, and uh, just as a final um, point about this, and this is essentially what we were describing uh, just before, if we have such a classical procedure, so a classical procedure uh, 
such as, as this one. Um, this will determine, uh, so this is a description of the procedures that we would uh, follow in order to implement uh, or to simulate a box of type T from a box of type S. And indeed, it does induce a, um, a map or a function between empirical models in S into empirical models in T. And moreover, this function will be convex preserving, so it will, by, by which I mean it, it preserves convex combinations uh, precisely. Uh, and now, uh, so in a sense, this sort of concludes the the uh, the, uh, the first part of introducing sort of the basic elements of the formalism of uh, the resource theory of contextuality. And now, the question we're going to consider uh, from now on is the following. Which is, which, which is to try to characterize which such transformations can arise in these factions. So which black box, so which, which functions that map empirical models in S to empirical models in T arise from classical procedures. Right, so putting it, uh, just, just saying it uh, again, putting it here in the box, so this is the main question. So we're given a function from empirical models of S to empirical models of T. And we want to know whether it can be realized by uh, by a classical procedure from S from um, S to T. So before we uh, try to look at this in, in more detail, let's ju let's just first analyze this question, and in particular we'll look at a special case of this question, which is the case when the the empirical model S here is just the sorry the uh, I apologize, sort of the, the measurement scenario S here is just a trivial measurement scenario, which I'm going to call I, which is the measurement scenario that has no measurements, uh, and therefore uh, we don't have to specify any outcome, so it's the measurement scenario is zero measurements. And you, you will note that if you have a measurement scenario with, with no measurements, then what is, an S ex, what is an S experiment or an I experiment here? Well, so in general, an S experiment, you have to choose a subset of the measurements to perform, so that part you have no choice. So you just you can't perform anything. So you just have to to select the empty set. And uh, the second part of it is that you have to interpret the joint outcomes of such measurements uh, into an outcome of the right type. So an an O valued uh, S experiment for for an O valued I experiment here uh, essentially will just have this part, which interprets the outcome of the measurements you perform. So that is the empty. You perform the empty set of measurements, so there's only one possible outcome, which is uh, you, you, you observe nothing, so it's the empty tuple if you want. And, and therefore, uh, an S experiment is really just a choice of an element of this set of values O. Uh, so, but more, uh, so, but now, so this is sort of to explain what this, what this uh, special case we're looking at is. And indeed, if you look at this question and, and uh, instantiate it to the case where s is equal to i, uh, so this is what you get. Uh, so here is our little, uh, I don't know if you see my pointer or not, but uh, can, can yes, you see you my, can. yeah, you can yes, see my pointer. Can, okay. can see it. Great. Uh, so here is, is, here is sort of the depiction of this of these, uh, um, measurement scenario. Or this black box where you can't you can't perform any measurement, uh, and uh, so we're given this function from empirical models of I into empirical models of T. So essentially, there's only a single possible empirical model of I because there's no interaction you can make. So there's no there's no uh, there's no measurements you can make. So this is, so the empirical models of I are a singleton set, and therefore such a function is really again just a, uh, an empirical model of T. So what we mean here is that we're saying, given an empirical model of T, uh, so that, that sort of translates, uh, so instantiates this first part. Uh, and then the question is, can it be realized by a classical procedure? I, is there a classical, is there a procedure from I to T which realizes this? But note that a procedure from I to T is just a selection of a bunch of uh, empirical, um, sorry, a bunch of experiments to, uh, to interact with the box I. But as I was just saying, such experiments are just an outcome of the right type. So what we mean here is whether we have, so any such thing is just a, an outcome of the type of T. And so when we say, where, when we ask whether it can be realized by a classical procedure, we're really just asking whether it is non-contextual. So whether it has, uh, it can be a sort of a complex combination of deterministic models, which have these, um, uh, 
specified outcomes uh, to all possible measurements. So, in, in other words, the non-contextual models are exactly those that can be uh, simulated from uh, that can be simulated from nothing. And uh, in in the, in the resource theory, so that's sort of a, a sanity check in some sense. But indeed, uh, so I guess what we've just seen is that if we look at this um, question that we're considering now, it is really just a generalizer version of this more well-studied and, and well-known uh, and well-studied question of uh, uh, of asking whether a particular empirical model is contextual or not. But <coughs> so indeed, so the, the question we're considering is really sort of a, a more uh, general version of that, in a sense is a relativized version of that, which go, which moves from just considering objects into considering transformations between them. Uh, and what is perhaps more surprising is that the answer, so one way to answer this uh, question up here is actually to reduce it back to the original question uh, from where it came. Um, so let me try to just give a, a brief sketch of, of uh, how this answer goes. So the idea is that if you start from these two scenarios, S and T, there's a new measurement scenario that you can build. This, uh, uh, well, call it HOM of ST. And then any convex preserving function uh, that maps empirical models of S to empirical models of T uh, is turned into a canonical empirical model of this new scenario, HOM of ST, in such a way that this function is realized by a deterministic procedure if and only if this model here that we constructed is uh, deterministic. And moreover, it's realized by a classical procedure or a probabilistic procedure, if and only if this model we constructed is non-contextual. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, I'm, I, what I said is not quite true. There's a, 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 a little a bit more that you need to add, which is that you have to require that this, um, the model that you construct is not only deterministic or non-contextual, but also satisfies a certain predicate. And what I mean by a predicate is um, well, in, in our formalism, you could think of it as a map um, or a simulation or a, sorry, a classical procedure that goes from S, uh, in this case, from, from home of ST into the, the, uh, the scenario that has a single measurement and two possible outcomes, which you can think of as false and true. And when you say that a, a particular model satisfies it, it means that whenever you apply this classical procedure, you always get the outcome true. Or in another another way to think of it is that it's just uh, really uh, a, a subset of uh, so for for each uh, possible context it corresponds to a subset of of the joint outcomes that are and and you're requiring that all the uh, all the um, all the outcomes that are possible so they have probability larger than zero in your empirical model must be within this subset. Uh, Another um, way of putting that, which might be more familiar to some, is that it's you, you can think of such predicates as essentially an, uh, well, a generalization of a non-local game, or if you like, a, a contextual game. And to have uh, and, and to satisfy that predicate means that this particular empirical model has to be a winning strategy, sort of a, a perfect strategy for that non-local game. Okay, uh, so I'm not sure if I have how much time I have now. I think I'll have time to give a, a little uh, more details on this, and in particular on this construction of the home scenario ST. And so what is this scenario that is built out of ST? So the uh, the first, uh, so we have to specify the measurements, their compatibility structure, and the outcome set for each measurement. So the measurements are exactly the same as T, as those of T, and so is, uh, and so is the compatibility structure. Uh, an outcome, though, for a particular measurement x from t will be not uh, will be no longer just what it used to be an outcome of t, but it will be a protocol for interacting with s and producing an outcome of x. So it will be essentially an s experiment valued in in the uh, in um, the outcome set of t. And um, moreover, the protocols that are given as joint outcomes to compatible measurements must be jointly performable. And the way to guarantee this is, 
is 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 by uh, capturing it by, via this predicate or, or uh, winning condition for a, a contextual game. Uh, right, and therefore, what is a non-contextual model now? So a non-contextual model for such a scenario is exactly would correspond exactly to having a, a predetermined choice, or rather, sorry. I should say a deterministic model for that scenario will correspond to having a predetermined choice of an outcome or of one of these uh, protocols or S experiments for each measurement in T. And therefore, they correspond exactly to the classical procedures uh, that map the scenario S to the scenario T. And, uh, or rather, to the deterministic procedures. And the non contextual model is just sort of the, the probabilistic version of that. So there are complex combinations of deterministic models, and therefore, they would correspond to, to classical probabilistic procedures. Uh, right, uh, so just to see how this would work, let's just look at this, uh, what we could call the evaluation map. And uh, I have here a bunch of square uh, of scare quotes, uh, pardon me, of, uh, of scare quotes. Uh, and the uh, and the reason I'm I'm putting um, I'm putting these quotes here is that this is not quite the usual. Um, tensor product or parallel composition of uh, scenarios that we consider. And also this arrow here is not really the same arrows that we're considering now, but, uh, uh, but is a, a slightly more general version where we had allow for some adaptivity. But let's just, but it's still, I think, instructive to see how this would work. So if we have, uh, so what, what I mean by here is that let's imagine we have a box of type S and uh, a box of these home type ST, then we could use them both to produce a box of type T. And the way we would go about that is just, let's imagine we decide to perform these two measurements in T. What we would do is that we perform those measurements in ST, observe their outcomes. Those outcomes are in fact protocols uh, for an, an S experiment. And so we would just go and follow those protocols to interact with S and then uh, use the outcomes that we get there uh, also following the protocols using the outcomes from there to calculate the corresponding outcomes for each of the pink and the red measurements. And those would be the outcomes that we get uh, for the box T. Um, right, so uh, just to answer, uh, 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 so this, this, this kind of, we've described how, how we get this, um, how we build this home scenario. Uh, now we also have to talk about how to build the uh, how to build the corresponding empirical model that is given a, a function uh, from empirical models of S to empirical models of T. And so this, so this, this uh, we'll, we'll do this in three parts. So the, the first thing is to just notice a, a few facts. So first is that every no signaling empirical model is in fact an affine mixture of deterministic models. And by affine, I mean, so it's not a convex mixture. So that would be the, those would be the non-contextual models, but it's affine. So we allow for some negative probabilities. And in fact, this is, uh, uh, I guess this goes back to, to the paper by, by uh, Samson and Adam Brandenburger, where they've showed that uh, you can, uh, so if, if you allow for negative probabilities, then you could actually get any no signaling empirical model. So no signaling is equivalent to negative probabilities. And moreover, a second fact that one might notice is that if you have a function uh, that preserves convex mixtures, then it will also preserve uh, affine mixtures. And therefore, so from, from these two things, we, uh, we know that if you have a function preserving, uh, sort of a convex combination preserving function between empirical models of S and empirical models of T, then it will be determined by its action on the deterministic models. Uh, because, uh, right, so if, if you know what, what it does for deterministic models, then obviously by the fact that it, convex, it preserves convex combinations, you would know what it does to any non-contextual model. But also because this implies that it preserves affine combinations, then we also know what it does to any um, uh, to any no signaling model, to any empirical model in general. Okay, so now let's just <coughs> uh, apply this in particular to the case of an S experiment. So an S experiment with values in uh, in this in in the set of one to n is just a classic procedure or can be thought of as a classical procedure between the, the, the scenario S and the scenario N or bold N here, which is a scenario that has a single measurement whose outcomes are in this set 1 to N. So it's just another way of, of saying uh, what an S experiment is, uh, rather obvious. And the empirical models of such a scenario 
correspond exactly to uh, uh, probabilistic uh, distributions, probability distributions on these sets uh, 1 to n. Uh, and sort of using the, the observation from the previous slide, we know that a convex preserving function from the empirical models of S to empirical models of N, i.e. to the distributions on, on the set 1 to N, is determined by its action on the deterministic models only. And moreover, if we have such, so the action on deterministic models is, the function, is a function from deterministic models of S into distributions, uh, um, probability distributions uh, on, on the set 1 to N, and so this, so if you have such a function, this yields a convex mixture of functions of deterministic functions from determinist from the set uh, that S to uh, the set of uh, outcomes, the set of one to n. And then the second fact that one needs to use, um, uh, and here is kind of where we need to make the restriction to adapt to um, non-adaptive procedures. And uh, or it's because of these facts. So this, this is what fails if we try to generalize this to to uh, adaptive procedures. Uh, is that uh, if you have any function out of the out of the deterministic out of out of the I guess the global assignments on S or deterministic models on a scenario S, there is always a a smallest set of measurements that you need to perform in order to implement it. So there's there's, there's always a smallest set U of f. Uh, and, this, uh, and by mean, uh, when I say smallest, I mean uh, it's really minimal. So it's it's uh, it's it, it's below any other set that would suffice to to implement f. It's not just smallest in size. Um, what? Sorry, I mean minimum rather than minimal. Yes. Uh, so uh, what happened? Oh, there we are. So f, uh, so a function f, so this is such a deterministic function f from uh, the, the assignments of the deterministic models of s into 1 to n will correspond, will be induced by a deterministic experiment if and only if this uh, smallest set of measurements that you need to perform in order to implement it is compatible. Therefore, if you could implement it just by uh, performing a compatible set of measurements, essentially. But in, in fact, it, there's this canonical set that is the one that you would really need to perform, and so we could just look at those, and and uh, and we would need that to be compatible. And similarly, if you have a convex combination of such functions, then you need each of them to be uh, each. So just the, you need the set necessary to implement each of them to be a compatible set of measurements. Uh, so more generally, if you have a convex preserving map now between any the empirical models on any scenario S and any to any scenario T, again this is determined by the actions on the deterministic models of S. And um, and if we have a compatible set of measurements on T, then what we get is a mixture of deterministic functions that go from the deterministic models of S to the joint outcomes of these measurements. So precisely from uh, as uh, as we've done in the previous slide because uh, we're restricting to a compatible set of measurements here. And each such function could be rep replaced by one that measures only the least amount of measurements in S that is necessary uh, by the, the observation in the previous slide as well. And so in turn, this basically amounts to given for each context, we have some probabilistic data, uh, which, uh, and, and, and the point is that we can turn that uh, into, into an empirical model and in fact, it, it turns out that this is exactly a uh, gives you a, a known signaling vehicle model. So, in, indeed, so putting this together, if we start from any convex preserving function uh, between empirical models in S and empirical models in T, then we can canonically, and this canonically is important because the, the, it, it comes from the fact that we can always find these least uh, sets of measurements. Uh, that, that need to be performed in order to implement uh, such functions. So we can, it canonically induces a no signal link empirical model on this scenario, um, on this scenario, on this home scenario ST. And now, as I said, so this sort of the main uh, sort of the main result that, that characterizes which such functions can be induced or realized by a classical procedure is that th those are exactly those for which this scenario is non-contextual. And moreover, so first is non-contextual, and moreover, it satisfies this predicate, which is essentially taking into account 
of the, the, the compatibility structure of S. So making sure that we only ever uh, measure compatible things in S when we try to perform compatible measurements in T. The, uh, right, right, so this, this uh, Okay, uh, I'll just go quickly through this. So, but the, the fact that we needed to add these, this caveat sort of suggests that we should, instead of thinking of our basic elements as just being scenarios, we should think of them as being pairs of a scenario and a predicate. And those should be really our basic objects. And indeed, we can make this into a category. So now a morphism between two such things is given by a classical procedure uh, between S and T. Uh, which moreover has to satisfy the following condition, which is if we have an empirical model in S that satisfies the predicate G, then this procedure must transform it into an empirical model in T, which satisfies the predicate H. And if we, if we work in this uh, category, sort of slightly enlarged, so not just of scenarios and classical procedures, but scenarios with predicates and classical procedures that preserve such predicates, then uh, there is a... a, a a slight modification that we need to make into the, the home construction because we now need to take into account the predicates of uh, of the two scenarios S and T that, that, that uh, come as input to it. But then this makes this into a closed category. So what, what that means is that we can really think of this as kind of a, an internalization of, of uh, um, an internal home. So an inter a representation as an object of the morphisms between two objects. Objects, and I'll I'll skip through these because I don't have much time. But this is just explaining what a closed category is. If anyone is interested, you can look at the slides later or ask at the questions, and just end with a few questions, uh, uh, which are sort of left open by this. So the first one is: Can we find something similar for adaptive procedures? Uh, so this this just gives us a. a we, so we have this external characterization of non-adaptive procedures. So is there something similar that we can get in the adaptive case? As I said, there was this uh, issue or the sort of the the, the problem why the same the same uh, proof doesn't work is because of these finding this least uh, set of measurements. Uh, also, another question is: Can we do this uh, possibilistically or not? For for uh, what I mean is for for possibilistic empirical models. So those that where we only care about what's possible and not possible rather than the particular probabilities. And uh, a third question is that, so this, this set of predicates on S seems to play an important role. And um, it, it looks like we can, uh, we can, we can so if, if, if we take these predicates seriously on, on the predicates on measurement scenarios, so does the, the collection of all predicates on a particular measurement scenario seems to uh, give rise to uh, a structure that's like a Boolean algebra, but it's partial. So it's like the operations in particular meet and join are only partially defined. And uh, this is somewhat related to some other work that I've uh, uh, done with Samson and that in a sense goes back to the original papers by, uh, by uh, um, the original papers on contextuality by Kochen and Specker, where, they, where contextuality was really phrased in terms of partial Boolean algebras. Uh, but uh, indeed, so this is something that I've actually been looking at uh, with with Marty, and uh, uh, I guess the final point is that we looked at this uh, close. Uh, we mentioned this closed structure or this this uh, categorical structure that, that means that we can think of of, uh, of uh, uh, this sort of an internal representation as an object of morphisms between any two objects, and usually one thinks of of such structures. Uh, they, they come accompanied by a monoidal structure, so we, we think of them as an adjoint to a monoidal product, or uh, where a monoidal structure is a way of putting two things together um, in parallel, such as a, a tensor product or such. Uh, but this is not, so this closed structure is not a monoidal closed structure with respect to the usual uh, monoidal structure that we have on uh, scenarios and the resource theory of, of contextuality, uh, but it seems closer to something like a directed tensor product where because where it matters, where we can do adaptive, uh, where we need to add some sort of possibility of making adaptive uh, procedures, but these adaptive procedures have to follow an order. So we first have to measure things in one of the boxes, and then given the outcomes of that, we can go and measure things on the other box, but we cannot go back and forth as we usually uh, can when we consider it sort of the, the general adaptive um, 
uh, resource theory of contextuality. And I think that's, uh, that was my final slide. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, take them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Rui.